Hi to everyone. It's a Friday evening still, so yes. that's amazing. I mean, that's real dedication here, I think, <laughs> um, that you actually make it. Uh, shows your passion for photography. Uh, super. So yeah. I'm going to hand this over to you, Acacia. Uh, I hope that I allowed the screen sharing. Yeah, it should all work. Yeah. So it's a big honor, really, for us to, to have us here. So you're the Canon... Um, Youth Ambassador, I think that's really exciting. Maybe just to start the whole thing off, as I said before, and I'm really nosy, I really <laughs> curious about our, our, our speakers. Um, how did you, how did it happen that you became the Youth Ambassador for Canon? Yeah, sure. Um, I will share it because I actually prepared the whole story of how I became a Canon Ambassador. <laughs> so you guys will find out what actually happens in the journey. So can you guys see this? Is that right? Yes, perfect. Right. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Acacia. That's how you pronounce my name. It's my actual name. I think a lot of people think it's like a glamour, glamour name or a celebrity name. But no, it's not. It's on my birth certificate. Um, it's a plant, actually. And I am a photographer and a designer. I'm based in Malaysia and the UK. And like... As introduced by Holger here, I am a Canon US Youth Ambassador um, from Canon Malaysia. And um, I think I would also like to mention that if you guys want to watch this talk or be alerted on any of the future London Institute of Photography talks, please follow their social media as well. I think not just their website, because I think a lot of people here knew about the talk from social media. So back to my introductions, um, the photo, this photos, the photography style that I do is a lot revolves a lot revolves a lot around travel architecture and design, mostly on the arts world as well. Um, you will see a lot more photos from my traveling and architectural works in this talk. Um, I nowadays, as a Canon US Youth Ambassador that specializes in travel photography. I work a lot with tourism bodies and hospitality bodies, as well as architectural bodies. Um, you can see some airlines there, some um, tourism bodies like Turkey Tourism, um, T Tourism Malaysia, Firefly Airlines. Um, but I also do some product photography um, for a lot of other brands in the beauty tech um, industry as well. And I think as a photographer, you want to specialize in something, but you should also be versatile enough to diversify your eye um, to show other things as well. And so yeah, so um, I started my photography journey back in 2018. So I think it's been about what, six, seven years? I don't think 2020 counts, Holger. I think everybody's just cancelling the year. <laughs> it's, the year just simply hasn't existed. It was wiped yeah. out. Yeah, and it's all already the end of 2021, which is a bit insane. So yeah, um, so it's been, I've been thinking about six, seven years since 2015. And I started because I was studying architecture in London at the University of Greenwich. Um, so I was doing my master's and I thought, you know, I'm going to be far away from home so because I did my degree in Malaysia. So I start, decided to invest in a camera. I bought a secondhand camera and I thought, let's just figure out how to use this during my studies. So when you study architecture, you have to do a lot of site visits and you have to study buildings and the context and everything. So that was what I bought the camera for. But obviously when you go to all these beautiful sites around Europe, um, you are so tempted to capture more of what you see. So I didn't end up just capturing architecture, I ended up capturing a lot of basically travel photos and it started off a lot as holiday photos. I think every student who has studied abroad can relate to wanting to travel and just taking photos for the gram. And back then I think Instagram had just started. So I was enjoying sharing all these photos on Instagram and all my friends were like, oh, this is so cool. And I think having a support system who support, um, that really encourages you in your passion is quite important when you start off and discovering something new. Um, these are just some photos um, of some of my architectural site visits. This was um, the City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia. I think I went here on a solo trip just to study what um, patterns and lighting and design. And it really helped me set the foundation of how I started to capture photos. Um, because you start to notice um, things in terms of symmetry, in terms of composition, in terms of framing. And at the beginning, it was just 
to present to my tutors. It wasn't anything serious. But when the tutors sort of commented on how I documented the architectural aspects of um, the buildings that I visited, I sort of developed an eye for photography. So that was how it started, basically. And then um, I graduated in 2017 and I went back to Malaysia and I enrolled in a program with Canon Malaysia. Um, so I think in October 2017, they posted this open call on Facebook um, calling for Canon Youth Ambassadors, which I think, and I wasn't at the time, I really wasn't following the Canon social media pages, or, um, but some of my friends were and they shared this to me. So I would just like to emphasize for any students out there or any youth or any amateur photographers or even anyone really, if you really want to get um, to find these opportunities to grow, um, do follow social medias, um, do follow websites and turn on the notifications because you never know when the opening for enrollment might come and that could be your opportunity. In my case, I was very lucky that a friend saw this and she knew that I was interested mm -hmm. in photography. At the time, it was still a hobby because I didn't think of it as anything serious. And I, I remember thinking, God, I can't enroll for this. You know, I'm, I, I only take holiday photos for Instagram. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate because you always sort of tell, talk yourself down. You're like, this is canon, you know, how can you do this? But um, with my friend's encouragement, I submitted uh, my application on the last day of um, at an open call nationwide, so I think about, I think, 20 to 30 students from all over Malaysia, youth from all over Malaysia, joined the program. And it was an eight-month training, I think it was almost every week, where we were taught on various aspects of photography. So basically, they just took a bunch of young, um, some amateurs, some maybe professional photographers within that youth range of age, and just enrolled us in eight months of rigorous training and gave us everything that they could, which was amazing. And I'll share with you some of the classes that I went through because I think a lot of you will be interested in what we learned. Um, we went through a lot of classes within those eight months and one of it was portraiture. Um, so this is, uh, we were divided into groups and um, told, uh, uh, we were granted this opportunity to go around this big bungalow in the middle of nowhere um, where about I think a couple of models were seated in various rooms in the house so we had to decide as a group um, what sort of style to shoot them in whether it was natural lighting or artificial lighting with the strobes and the softbox and everything um, so Canon provided all the equipment and it was up to our creativity um, this was my group and this was one of the models that we found um, so this was uh, some of the shots from the day. So I need to emphasize that this was back in 2017. At the time, we were still young and experimenting. Um, this was shot with my first camera that I had, the Canon 600D. Um, at the time, of course, um, I, I don't really do portrait photography because I was always just snapping holiday shots. Um, so this was one of my first um, ventures into portrait photography. And I remember feeling so proud of these photos. It's so interesting because like a, a couple of years later, I look at this and I'm like, God, what, what, what am I shooting? <laughs> I think a lot of people feel like that. I think Hogo, you can relate just looking back at your old photos. Oh gosh, let's not talk about it. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because the, you know, in your formative years, yeah, when, you, when you're being exposed to a lot of, well, you know, new, insights new technologies new techniques i mean this is really the the phase in your career where you're really laying the foundation i think and so even you know like maybe in a in a more let's say like playful way but at the beginning but we're just learning so much we read like sponges and we just literally like soak everything up yeah and i think i think it's very rarely that people go out and become extremely amazing artists you know like nobody is really born at a hundred percent so you really have to go through the journey to develop your skill or your talent basically um so yeah so this was some of my portrait shots in 2017 so just to just to um satisfy myself i'll show you guys some shots from recent years so these are portraits that i shot in 2019 and 2020 
And um, obviously, I, as a travel photographer, I love using more um, natural lighting. And I think commercial photography or portrait photography would really um, explore more to its the artificial lighting. But for me personally, as somebody who moves around a lot, it's really hard. I mean, it's not so viable to carry all those equipments. So I just shoot with whatever I have at the time. Um, these photos are from, I think, 2019. This young boy, he's uh, he was in a, a small village in Harpa, um, in I think in southeastern Turkey. So he was um, managing the costumes for tourists to wear. So just a quick shot of him. Uh, the middle one is of a woman in a Syrian refugee camp in Turkey. So I did this for documentary work as well that I'll share a bit more later. And you can see how obviously within, I think just two, three years, you can develop your skill and composition to a certain level that you can be a bit more satisfied with. So yeah, so that's my portrait journey with Canon. Um, one of the other things that we learned was photojournalism. Uh, so it was one class with a veteran photojournalist in Malaysia. So he taught us how to find a, a story, how to compose it, how to caption it. Because I think with photojournalism, the story is really important. Um, all of us, all 30 of us students, we were brought to this um, cultural site in Malaysia. I don't know, have you ever been to Malaysia, Holger? No, I wish, no, unfortunately not. Okay. Well, if you ever do, I'm sure you will drop by this place. It's called Batu Caves in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, actually, the city capital. So it's a place where um, the Hindus worship. It's a place, it's a temple, basically, um, right in a cave with 220, 212 steps, I think, going up. And at the time, I was like, God, how do we even do photojournalism? Like, what is this? What story am I trying to find? Um, so you can see some of my shots here from 2017 as a student. Um, but then 2019, I went back and shot some photos during this uh, celebration called Taikusam, which is a big celebration at the site. And you can see how you sort of find ways to um, tell the story even better in a photo series. You have the establishing shots, you have the subject shots. Um, there's a lot more in this series that you can see on my website. Um, but yeah, so it's just developing photojournalism, which I enjoy as well. Um, I also did a couple of um, documentary work uh, for Chinta Syria Malaysia. So this, I think, involves a lot of aspects of photojournalism where you have to capture things in the moment, as real as it is, without um, editing it too much, without processing it too much, without beautifying it too much. Photojournalism really is about capturing the subjects and their journey um, and their lives. So this is some of my works from 2020 as well. Uh, one of the classes that we did um, with Canon as well was macro photography. I don't know if uh, the London Institute of Photography teaches macro photography, do you? Mm, um, it's part of our uh, still life curriculum. So in fact, all the still life shots are actually done with macro equipment. Oh, wow. Um, so I think like the, like the lens are actually optimized for best performance at short focusing distances. Etc. Um, but we don't, unfortunately, photograph spiders. You know that <laughs> push it a bit too far. But um, what we've done really for a long time is um, we have uh, photographed uh, kind of in the style of a German uh, biologist. Uh, he was um, basically like he he took like ultra macro shots of of like 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 plant parts in the 19th century, I think like around 1900 and yeah. uh, that used to be like part of the curriculum at the beginning so yeah I kind of I'm a bit familiar with that uh yes I think I've seen those photo series it's really beautiful very archival photos of yeah plant, I think yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a uh, Karl Blossfeld so he yes, yes, yes. basically really saw nature as the biggest architect um and it's really quite easy to do I mean you literally just need a, a simple backdrop yep uh, window lighting from one side, uh, white wall in the background, something just to prop up like the item, and then you just go all the way in with a macro lens. It's spectacular. Yeah, and you really get to capture the details and the patterns mm -hmm. of the plants, and it's so beautiful. Exactly, I yeah. think if anybody, yeah, if anybody wants to check that out, I think Carl Blossfeld. Carl Blossfeld, yeah. Yes, he's an amazing photographer. Um, so with this spider, it was this one centimeter tiny spider that they brought into the classroom in the office um, for all 30 students divided into groups. So we were just 
hankering over like six spiders around the room. And I'm so grateful that nobody like accidentally killed anything. Um, but we, yeah, this was some of the shots that we had of this very beautiful spider that we put up on our phones and on various mm. keys. So I think it's, it's, yeah, it's so fun. I think microphotography is so enjoyable, but I never really got into it except for with plants. Um, and one of the last things, one of the last classes that we had with uh, Canon during the training was street photography. And I think a lot of people, for a lot of people, this is the most accessible. I think if you have a camera, um, you can just go around, walk around and just take photos of the street, basically. And um, I'll share with you some of the street uh, shots that I've taken throughout my travels. Um, I think Palestine, this was where I was in 2018, was one of my favorite uh, places to photograph street photography because everybody was in various costumes, just naturally from all over the world coming to worship. You can see the various uh, the various attires that they had. Um, this was another one. And I think with street photography, I try to not um, think about it too much because it has to be candid, right? I mean, it is about the moment. Mm -hmm. It is about some guy, um, some shop seller by stall just waiting for customers to come or a man in a stall just waiting for, you know, like... Can I ask, uh, Alicia, can but I anyway, ask the, if yeah. you're traveling, it really looks as if you've been to some of the most amazing place on earth. Uh, and also, I mean, obviously like a place like uh, Palestine with a, a huge history of... Um, Conflict. I mean, so many life stories are being written yeah. there and it's beautiful and it's tragic at the same time. Was yeah. this something like the like the travel itself that was part of the uh, ambassadorship, or who initiated those those journeys? Oh, so basically, I I worked while enrolling in the Canon program. I was also working as a freelance photographer, and I positioned myself in such a way that I worked with um, a travel agency and some tourism bodies. So with Palestine in particular, specifically. Um, I was there to photograph, there was a tour group going, so I was there to photograph them for the marketing and promotions. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, I think if that's, that, was, that is one of the routes in which you can go down if you want to do, develop a career in travel photography. Mm -hmm. Because I aligned myself with the travel agency and whenever they needed promotional materials, they just sent me off with the group. So mm -hmm. yeah, and Canon would support in terms of equipment. So say, you know, if I needed any extra lenses or anything, they would be happy to provide it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, eight months, so that was eight months of my life. Um, I think and out of the 30 people, six of us were finally chosen to be Canon AOS Youth Ambassadors. Um, we were graded based on so many things, not just our photography style. Um, because I think the main reason for the program was to bridge that gap between young photographers and uh, master photographers. I think a lot of people think when you become a brand ambassador, you have to reach a certain level of professionalism. And for master photographers, it is definitely true. But a lot of young people who just want to start photography get quite discouraged or quite, quite scared. So as a youth ambassador, we are somewhere in the bridge in between because I mean, uh, we are also just starting our career and not all of us are professional photographers. Uh, some of us just do it for a hobby. Um, just to explain to you guys between the six of us in this photo, so there's me. So I do a lot of travel and architecture photography. Uh, behind me, there's Anis Lin. Um, she does sports photography. So she recently went to the Tokyo Olympics. Um, so she got to photograph that. It's amazing. She was representing Malaysia as the photography cohort. Um, there's Sam and Ruben, the two guys on the couch. Um, one one behind so they do uh, commercial photography there's Rhiannon as well so she does abstract conceptual photography and there's Barathan um, on right next to me he does events so there's this very diverse group of us and we go around and share about our hobbies and our works to the audience basically to, uh, to anybody out there and part of my role as a Canon ambassador as well is that we host workshops we test out the equipment we go to the events, um, we celebrate um, various photography events like Natural, uh, National Camera Day, and we go, uh, we go for exhibitions that are supported by Canon. And it's a really amazing ecosystem. It's a really amazing support because it's not as scary as you might think. So I think if any of you out there really want to get into photography or be, or 
um, align yourself with a brand, please just start following them on social media or just find friends who are also using the brand. And I think there is that's already a starting point that you can get to. Okay. So yeah, so um, as well we can, and like I said, with the um, with the lenses that they lend out, one of my favorite parts of being Canon ambassador is that I get to test out lenses that I wouldn't be able to afford um, naturally. Because I, I mean, honestly, to to be completely honest, photography can be an expensive hobby, and traveling can be even more expensive. So having a support system um, of friends that you can borrow from or loan equipment from is really amazing. But obviously I would encourage you to invest in equipment if you can. Um, this was one of my favorite shots I'd ever taken. It was with the fisheye lens. Uh, the fisheye lens is one of my favorite lenses to use. Um, it can be, you can go very wrong with it, but when you can get it right, you can get it so right. Like this shot um, that I took during summer uh, with the Canon 6D Mark II and the fisheye 1855, I think. Um, I also got to test out this uh, wide angle lenses, which I think is very, um, crucial for architecture because you get to use you get so much more than you can get with a crop sensor just to share with you the first four years of my um, photography journey I shot with a Canon 600D which is a crop lens and when I first started using a full full frame lens I was blown away I I didn't even think that something existed like that so yeah, just keep discovering, guys, because there's so many, like, I think brands are coming up with so many new equipment, uh, so many new technologies. There are so many more lenses that you can try out, and I think it's so fun. Um, and, you know, like I said, photography can be a very fun thing. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you get to experiment a lot and, you know, pass it off as art. So don't be, you know, don't sink yourself too much from it. So, yeah, so that's um, my Canon... US Youth Ambassador journey. So I've been with them since 2018. I think that's when I was conferred. And over the past years, I've done a lot of traveling. I said, well, I said the past year. And it's been amazing because, like I mentioned before, I've worked with tourism bodies and travel agencies and hotels, even uh, to capture all these beautiful places around the world. Uh, one of the projects that I wanted to share with you um, today is. My, the project that actually started it all, uh, my passion for photography and travel, which is called Karya Kasha. This is uh, in Malay. Uh, in English, I think it means, um, Karya means craft, I think. So um, it's, a, it's like my craft, essentially. And what it is, is this travel journal that I brought with me around um, when I first started traveling during my university years. And I brought it with me everywhere and it's, um, and I wrote the names of the cities that I went to and I decorated it with um, patterns or imagery that reflected the location. Um, Lisbon with the blue tiles and Porto with the famous flowers. Uh, Valencia was quite an abstract. Um, Valencia and Barcelona was quite an abstract artistic thing. Um, this is, I think, Krabi in Thailand that's got a coconut on it and Muscat, which was an accidental transit, um, had a couple of local patterns and it started as something fun but I think once I started doing it and I started going to various other places it just continued and I enjoyed it so much and a lot of people got um, a lot of people became quite excited to see where I would go next and what sort of uh, what sort of craft I would do for the location and it also encouraged me to do something um, with it to make something out of it because it was just so fun and if, and like I said, it wasn't anything official or anything serious. It was just something that I enjoy doing. So one of the first tips I always give people who want to start photography or who, or who want to develop their career in photography, gravitate to something that you love, gravitate to what speaks to you. And for me, this came as something very natural. It wasn't something that I felt, okay, I have to do this. Um, this is something that I need to think about or analyze or strategize. It was just something that I went to a place and I've got a bunch of pens or whatever and I just started doodling in the middle of the street or something and took a photo with it. Um, and it grew, of course, these are just some of the places that I've been to. I know there's so many, it's like a whole video. Um, this project was actually shortlisted for Air Asia Airlines um, Ambassador Program back in 2018. So it was really fun. But what I wanted, so let me just delve a bit more into it. Mm -hmm. With every Karya Kasha that I took, it obviously represented the location that I was in. Um, 
And with the location came the memories and the visuals that came with it. So one of my favorite travel locations ever in this whole in the whole is Iceland. I don't know if you've been. Have you ever been, Holger? No, also another one on my list. <laughs> Never been there. I hope you get there soon because it's so so beautiful. It's, mm. I mean, it was it was one of the first locations that I went to that really. Um, inspired me to take more photos of landscape and travel. Um, as you can see, like it was one of the countries that made me feel so insignificant because the sheer scale of everything was so huge. And we went during an off tour season in, in April, so there weren't people at all. So you can imagine just being this one person who maybe told my other friends in this vast landscape and just 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 experiencing that was out of this world. And the best part of this is that I actually shot all of this with my Canon 600D, which at the time, as, as I mentioned, is a crop frame. So I can't imagine if I ever go back and shoot it with a full frame, I think I'll just, I'll just be also blown away. Um, one of the things that I need to emphasize with my trip to Iceland is that it really taught me how to, um, how to pivot yourself, how to navigate yourself in certain situations like, you can experience a view that people have seen so many times, but you can also pivot your body or your view to the slightly to the right or slightly to the left, and it can give, give you something completely different. Like for me, um, this was a view that we shot from the church tower in Reykjavik, and a lot of people have seen the image that, that looks directly forward. I'll share it a bit later. I think I have it in the series. Mm -hmm. But I, looked, I just looked to the right and got this photo instead, which I greatly enjoyed, and the composition is so much better. So I think that's one of the ways that you can develop your photography as well. Um, and also it taught me how to use scale, human scale, to show landscape photos. I think this is a very basic um, composition technique, but it's so effective when you're shooting landscape. I think a lot of people use this. Um, you can see as well, this is a very extreme composition in scale. If you look at the top there, you can see all these tiny people looking at golfers, which is one of the biggest... Um, waterfalls in Iceland it's amazing I just appreciate how tiny you are like in this huge um, view and I also learned about textures and compose composing with the rule of thirds and everything um, focusing on you know elements of nature that are not necessarily so beautiful but they are beautiful in their own way so that's what that was one of my favorite parts about Iceland that really invigorated my passion for photography. How long did you, I, did you stay in Iceland? Okay. We were there, I think, for about seven days. Ah, super. Seven days, yeah. I think it was, was mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that was enough, but maybe just about enough for an amateur photographer. Mm -hmm. um, and I say amateur because you can see from this photo that this was shot without a tripod. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with uh, with um, handheld us shaking um, in the in the cold and this was at a time where I had no idea what raw files were so mm. this was a JPEG and we were just cranked up the eyes mm -hmm. so, yeah and I think it's it's fun to look back and obviously at the time we were just up and down in Glee having shot this photo and in a way I'm so quite proud of it because it just goes to show that there is always room to grow and just don't worry about the technical aspects so much just enjoy the photo taking I think especially if you're traveling um, which is a lesson that I learned a lot when I was in Egypt so Egypt was I think a couple of months after Iceland so you can see how it was two very diverse uh, two very polar opposites in terms of visuals and in terms of environments um, Egypt was an accidental trip as well I just called I just tweeted who's in Egypt let me come visit you and some random Malaysian student replied, I'm in Egypt, you can come stay with me. So I think if you want to start traveling, please harness the power of social media and find a community there. Um, Egypt is brilliant for street photography. The culture at street level is so rich. There are so many visual cues that you can focus on, um, so many stories that you can get in one photo. Um, there's all the street markets, all the... A mosque, all the homes and people are just, it's so busy. It's so, it's like the complete opposite of Iceland. To be completely honest, I think after four days, I just wanted to leave. I was like, I'm done. This is too loud. This is too dusty. It's too hot. 
let's look around. And um, at even at rooftop level, it's so interesting because the city is so packed and so dense. Um, but one of the highlights for this trip was we went out um, for a trip to Bahariya, which is, I think, about four hours outside of Cairo, right in the middle of the desert, because we wanted to check out the, um, the stars and camp out in the Sahara Desert. And I got to shoot a couple of very, very dodgy photos because we were in a bus and it was so hot. And, you know, I didn't really want to emphasize on um, beauty or whatever. I just wanted to capture the travel photos as is. And in some ways, I keep emphasizing this, it's more important to be authentic to the experience than to capture something completely beautiful. And so, yeah, so a lot of the photos were a bit out of focus, but it really captured the essence of the adventure there. And I think um, it's one of my favorite memories because we didn't plan on anything. It just so happened that we ended up in the middle of the white desert in Egypt on a random June. So I think um, this was also early on in my career. So all of this was just done out of hobby, out of um, from my own money, um, from you know from my own from my own um, incentive. Um, and I and I curated all these photos that I later uh, uh, compiled into a portfolio to present to some companies to show that I could do the work. So I think if you want to get into travel photography, it's better to have a certain body of work that clients can look at and refer to so that they know that you can do the work. Yep. And then uh, this was just a couple more from the Karyakasha series of something we, I take you from the landscape of Iceland to the streets of um, Egypt and now a bit more into the very, very dense packed um, city of Hong Kong. Hong Kong was one of my last trips before COVID hit. I spent New Year there in 2019, 2020. This was at the heights of the Hong Kong protests. Um, we were caught in the masses um, on New Year's Eve actually, but before that I enjoyed a couple of days just going around and capturing urban photography. If you ever get a chance to travel to Hong Kong, please um, bring a really good camera because the visual cues are so stunning and you really get to practice your, um, your, your skill of composition because there's so many things to capture. Um, you can see at the bottom left as well that there are some soldiers that I took um, during the night of protest because there were so many people. And Hong Kong itself is a very colorful city, so you can play a lot with the colors as well. I think if you're quite familiar with urban photography, you will see a lot of people who have gone to Hong Kong come up with all these crazy beautiful images. Um, and you can curate stories based on your travel photos as well. Like when I posted this on my Instagram, a lot of people asked me, are you there with your boyfriend? Like, is, are you finally revealing this is your boyfriend? And I was just like, no, these are just some random strangers that I took photos of. Obviously, it was if it was my boyfriend, I would never tell. <laughs> but um, you can you can you can always create all these sort of stories and play around with silhou silhouettes, and it's very cyber neon punk in Hong Kong. Um, again, at street level, it's just visual, like everything is just bombarding you. So getting that into a photo to capture it is is just an experience. Um, Go for the candid shots as well, like, you know, play around with foregrounds and backgrounds just to capture the density. These are actually two different photos that I stitched together to show how intense it is. Play around with diptychs as well. I think um, with Hong Kong, I presented this um, series uh, for a competition and just to show how dense the, play, um, the city was. So I presented my portfolio in this way where I just do it, did it in a diptych. So, um, so the photos are all packed together. And it's not just buildings as well. It's human interest. It's portraits of an old lady who initially was like, no, no, I don't want my photo to be taken. But eventually, once you talk to them slowly and once you just smile at them, I think you can break the ice and take a really nice photo. That's a really important skill for a travel photographer to have the ability to talk to people, strangers, and just be like, hi, you know, you look amazing. I'm a photographer. Can I take your photo? Earlier on in my career, I avoided it like the plague. I was like, I'm not going to talk to people. I'm not going to bother people because as a person, I don't like to be bothered, obviously. I'm not sure if you're the kind of person. Who, I think some people just naturally have the inclination to just talk to anybody. Um, but for me, it was years of skill. So finally, I, I cracked this, the nuts of this lady. So she got she gave me a smile because initially she was just, you know, uninterested. 
Uh, so yeah, so um, this was a lot of these photos were shot in my Canon USR, which is really amazing for um, long exposure photography. I I I'm a type of person who does not like to carry a lot of things with me. So even this was shot as a handheld, and I think if your hands are stable enough, you can get quite really good shots with the right camera. So yeah, so this is Hong Kong. It's a very very magical place. So I hope. Holger, you get to go there if you have not been. I feel bad because yeah, I keep asking you. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm, I must confess, I'm a huge uh, science fiction fan. Ah. And I think it has really something. It you know, it has something very almost like dystopian. Yes. And uh, I think it's like the the, um, the 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 like the blueprint basically, like for lots of like you know like science fiction novels, and uh, I always want to go. And I mean, funny enough, really, just before COVID-19 hit, I had actually a photo shoot, like a trip and a photo shoot planned to Hong Kong. And obviously uh, COVID-19 just like, you know, ruined everything. Yeah. Um, so it's still, you know, um, I still have hopes. Hopefully next year it's going to be better. Fingers crossed. Mm. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully next year we get to go to a lot of places. But I think being in London as well, um, because I was in Malaysia a couple of months ago, and we were in complete lockdown, obviously, still. I think now it's just starting to open up. But coming back to London, it has really opened up my, uh, my, what I say, my motivation to start shooting again at street level. So I think anybody who, if you're in the city and if you like photography, please just go around and start shooting mm -hmm. because everything's opening up now. And there's so many opportunities. It's, it's really interesting that, that you mentioned to almost use the camera as an excuse to do something you really want. You know, yeah. something that we really encourage our students to do a lot. Like, you know, a camera can take you to so many absolutely amazing, interesting spots that you would probably, without a camera, n never have access to. But the fact that you're actually having a camera and showing some, um, a showing uh, uh, a, an, an honest interest in something or someone, and all of a sudden those doors open up for you. Uh, and it's such a powerful tool. And you can really use it to do something yeah that, that you always want to do travel somewhere well make a photo story out of it visit somewhere try to get gain access to a certain location the camera just makes everything so much easier mm. yeah i completely agree and i think with, with the right camera as well um you can get photos that you never even thought you could like when you play when you start playing with um, exposure settings and shutter settings i think and even if you have more fun lenses you can get photos that are very creative as well but i would also like to emphasize that you know don't pressure yourself by by going to a place and thinking okay this is the type of things i have to get and you know being very stressed out over it i think you get so much better work and better results when you are enjoying the process and you are relaxed and you are comfortable i think as a photographer as well you have to be comfortable with what you're shooting be it a subject or a building because they the work will reflect how you feel. It is, I mean, photography is a very personal um, process, I feel. Even when you're doing commercial work or product work, there is always a bit of you inside it. I mean, you are the one who composes the photo. So if you're not comfortable with it, it really shows in the photos. So yeah. So I think um, one of the last one, I think I'm not sure how we are with time. Okay, we've got a couple more minutes, 15 more minutes. Um, with uh, Nepal was one of, also one of my last trips before COVID-19 hit. And um, after this trip, I'm going to be honest, because we were planning to go to the um, Everest base camp, but we didn't. We ended up at another hill completely because we were short on time. And I think after this trip, I was just completely done with hiking. I was like, I'm never going to go hiking ever <laughs> again. I, yeah, I think as a travel photographer, a lot of people think that, you know, you have to be very adventurous and up for everything. And I wish that I was, but I think it was 14 hours of three days hiking and I'm, I am human. So, but who knows, maybe in a couple of years, I can get back to the motivation to go hiking. Mm. But um, Nepal, I did this project for Malaysia airports and um, a bit for Malaysia airlines for the publications. And it was just such a beautiful, magical place. Like you hear stories of um, Kathmandu being so busy, but it's actually a very historical, very spiritual place. It, I think Kathmandu, if I'm not mistaken, is the city of 
a thousand temples or something like that. And there are so many temples that you can visit and you can really um, create a broad range of photography portfolio from architecture to street um, to, you know, travel photography. This is a bit of street photography. You can see how completely packed it is in Kathmandu, um, just getting the essence of, you know, the vibe of the place. Um, I also shoot some street portraits. I'm actually hoping to develop, to develop this sort of um, woman just hanging around portraits, I think, because this was one of my favourite shots that I took during the trip. And it looks like they were posing, but they really weren't. They were just sitting there talking to each other. And I just happened to pass by and I was like, can I just take a quick photo? And they were like, yeah, yeah sure. And I just <laughs> sat there and looked at the camera, which I think makes for quite a nice photo. Um, and Kathmandu as well is, this was Bukhara, it's a beautiful lake. Um, the place has so many natural wonders. Obviously, being in the Himalayan range, that it really trains you to shoot um, landscape as well. I think this was one of my favorite landscape shots that I've ever shot in my whole life, only because of the colors. I think as a photographer, I gravitate more towards colors. I think some photo photographers um, pivot towards more black and white shots. I think especially street photographers, but for me personally, I like to. I think I embrace color, and I think uh, I think a basic or an advanced understanding in colors really helps you to grow and develop as a photographer because colors obviously play such an important role on how the photograph is perceived, whether it's cool or moody or dreamy or vibrant. I think just experiments because to be honest, you can see the difference between these four series of locations that I've shared. Um, Iceland was very blue and very serene. Egypt was very dusty, very warm, very yellow. Um, Hong Kong was obviously very urban, very neon punk, and Nepal is just dreamy landscapes. I try not to hold myself up into one certain aesthetic because I think it sort of limits yourself. Um, as you journey on as a photographer, you will eventually develop your own style, your own colours, your own aesthetics. So don't worry about curating your works so much. Um, I know that nowadays, especially with Instagram maybe, people advise you to have a certain color for cohesiveness on the feed or a certain set of, you know, a composition that will make you stand out as a photographer. And while those may work, I just hope that young photographers out there won't limit yourself to it. Because if you're, grow if you're just growing on this journey, you really should just experiment and do what you feel is right for the location or for the occasion. Because once you limit yourself, it really hinders the sort of thing. Um, not to say that you cannot have guidelines. I think having guidelines is really good. For example, whenever I go to a location, I uh, think of certain moods. I research about, you know, what shots that I want or how I want to curate it. So obviously there's planning and preparation involved. But I try not to let that um, hinder me too much. And there is always room for, um, you know, spontaneity. So you always, I think as, and I think you are quite familiar with it as well. I think it's something that, you know, young photographers or students who are studying should get into their head that, you know, just, mm -hmm. just chill out. It's, it's a very fun process. Um, for example, this is also one of my favorite shots, but you can see um, just a hint of the mountains in the background, but these are the prayer notes that they hang at one of the camps that we stopped um, along the way, along the very, very long hiking routes. Yes, yeah, so um, the Karyakasha project is um, available to be viewed on my website and on my Instagram, if you just search for the hashtag Karyakasha, it covers a lot more locations, um, which I will not get into too much of death. Um, this was Maldives that I shot for, I, I shot for a hotel in Maldives. If you ever become a travel photographer, I hope you also get the chance to visit all these amazing locations around the world. Um, but the only the, one of the only travel is that you get to go to all these locations, but sometimes you can only go there alone because the company will only you know pay for you alone. So I was in this beautiful paradise in Maldives, completely alone, and it was a very romantic place. So I was also wondering, what am I doing here alone? But the place is so beautiful, so you end up enjoying it nevertheless. Um, and a bit. I think this. Yeah, I think this. This concept um, of hooking up with with travel agency is just mm. great. Like yeah. um, we've got so many so many students, so many photographers here at the school that are really interested in 
travel photography. And the big question always is like, can you make a living? How can you finance this? How can you just make this work? And um, I think that is such an interesting, that's such an interesting approach. Was it difficult for you to find travel companies that you can collaborate with? Did you have to do a lot of pitching? I think for me, right, I uh, for me, one thing that made me, I guess, personally step ahead of it was during my studies, I was traveling for fun. So during all that, I, I had already built my portfolio and I had already built a certain level of following on my social media. So I think that helped a lot for companies to scout me. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important parts that you you need to have is a strong body of work um, when for me how I started with this special with this uh, specific travel agency was that they scouted me um, because they were looking for somebody who was based in London who was Malaysian because they were bringing a lot of Malaysian groups from Malaysia to Europe so I could be I could go around with them mm -hmm. so I think um, If you are not a native to the, to England, I think connecting with travel agencies who are local to your country might help as well because there are always people coming in. Um, obviously now it might be a bit more difficult, but more so than anything, being in London is actually one of the best places to be in the world right now. So you can definitely build, build your portfolio right now to get into travel photography. But yeah, um, I do a couple of pitching, but for my first jobs with a travel agency, they were the ones who scouted me based on my social medias. So I think mm. social media is a very important tool to have and to curate as a photographer. Um, yeah, so one of the places that I went to with a travel agency as well, um, like I mentioned, was Jerusalem, uh, which was, I think, you get to go to all these places that you wouldn't necessarily go to on your own because they require a lot of organizing and a lot of, you know, um, liaising with local authorities, especially with places like Jerusalem. Um, so yeah, so... Please, uh, if you have any questions about travel photography, just mm -hmm. hit them in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer otherwise. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the career pressure, um, like I said, uh, is av available to view on my website and my Instagram. There's a whole more, there's a whole bunch more of destinations that you can check out. And mm -hmm. there are so many stories behind each of them and so many photo mishaps be behind each of them. Um, just to mention as well that the project, this project was... Um, back in 2016, 17, a lot of my friends and a lot of my followers enjoyed it so much to the point where I decided to create a separate community group from it. So I created this mini project called La Caria. Uh, Caria meaning craft. Again, La was just decorative. So La Caria. But it was a project where people can um, do something similar, but not necessarily about travel, but it was just about motivational um, and positive works. So we were there, the whole project was about inspiration. So from my own personal travel project, Akaria Kasha, it developed into a community inspiration project where people just contributed their photos of wherever they are and their sketches and their works. And I think as a photographer or as somebody who wants to reach out to people, who wants to build a community, there's so many opportunities. And this project was one of the ways in which I reached out to other people to involve them in continuing to um, be inspired and be encouraged and be able to explore because that is, those are values that I really resonate with. Uh, you can follow this project on Instagram. It's uh, instagram.com slash la.caria. Um, and please feel free to contribute. Um, it is active and inactive. Um, it, gets uh, really active during mental health periods, uh, you know, mental health months or pride months or anything. And then it goes back down again, but it's, it's always going to be there. And I think it's such a nice way to connect with communities as a photographer, because it's obviously it's not always about you. It's, all, it's also about how you uh, put out your work and how you communicate with other people and involve people into your processes. And I think building a community is a really good um, part yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah, I have a whole bunch on architecture, but I'm not sure we have time. Do you have any I, questions? I'm sure we, we, we yeah. have time for that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what, what really interests me is the you are incredibly prolific. You, your, your output is really immense, I would say. Like uh, you work on different projects, you work on different 
different concepts and you shoot a lot obviously and a lot of really high quality work can you talk us a little bit maybe about your way of working are you very tricky ha trigger happy happy are you very considered when you take pictures how do you manage to create this type of output i must say by the way the um I forgot to switch on the light here in the studio. So I'm kind of <laughs> almost like sitting in the dark. That's the reason why this looks a bit dramatic. Right. Because right. I'm, <laughs> I'm just getting, getting this, this light here yeah. from, the, from, the, from the laptop. I hope you, you can use it. Do you want to switch on your light? Yeah. For, it's, yeah. you know, you're going to, okay, maybe in a second, maybe once, once you start to talk <laughs> about the um, architecture, don't want to be impolite just to disappear just out of the <laughs> out of the frame yeah once you start to talk about architecture i'm just going to be i'm going to sneak out and just really quickly switch on the light yeah, yeah. I'm just because i was so, so desperate <laughs> i just really put my put my iphone, here your because iPhone? I that at least there there should be some sort of light really just like yeah so, I, I'm, i'm surprised I'm surprised you don't have a ring light i think everybody now has a ring light yeah where they, when they do the video call. I'm not so much into this, into beauty photography for myself, but the, <laughs> maybe like that. No, okay, I'm, I'm making this worse, really. Um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you work. I mean, the, how, you, how you manage to juggle and to handle so many different projects. Um, yeah, I think, well... Here's the thing as well, um, in this past years, besides working as a freelance photographer, I have a full-time job as a designer. So I work in an agency nine to five every day. And to be honest, um, the basic truth of it is that it goes down to very, very meticulous time management. And you're just fueled by passion, so you have no time for anything else. And obviously, it's probably the reason why I'm also not involved with anybody at the moment my personal life has gone down the drain because I love my career so much. Um, that was a joke. Uh, but um, uh, for me, do you ask if I was trigger happy? Um, I can say that, I mean, I, I do believe so um, because I think when a moment moves me so much, I just, just go around snapping it. Um, I don't think too much about the composition, but obviously there are times when I, I have, planned location shoots where I, I know what I want to do when I get there and have everything set up. Um, as a travel photographer and as somebody who has to do vlogs as well for certain content, um, on a normal day, I would end up carrying maybe one um, GoPro, about two camera bodies and maybe one more camera and maybe even a drone. So there's a lot of equipment that you have to carry and you always I always make sure that I have enough equipment to prepare for any types of shoots that I might need. Um, what it comes down to basically, like I mentioned, is time management and knowing what you want. Um, I think knowing what you want out of the projects that you do um, helps you navigate your time and plan better. But that being said, obviously, it's not about limiting yourself to certain results because sometimes it really might not work out. Like I've been to locations or been to events where I just don't get any good shots. And that is completely normal as a photographer some days as you won't get anything useful. Um, but try to plan around it and try to take it in stride. Um, and I think more than anything as well, I was in my early 20s and I had a lot of energy and I liked making friends and traveling the world. And I feel that if you are given the opportunity to explore the world, to have all this energy at your disposal, you have so much more that you're capable of doing, things that you can't even imagine. Like for instance, this Lacaria project, I just did an Instagram account and then just gave it a shout out. Like, hey guys, if you want to submit, just submit. And within a month, there was like a thousand submissions. So you never know what might resonate with other people. And it was from people who didn't even know me. So just, if you have an idea, just go for it. Don't think too much about it. And you know, who knows where it might lead. I think for me, that, that's it basically. Yeah, just, just branch out because now that, I mean, now I think five, six years into my career, um, I have sort of honed it into certain projects and certain clientele and it has become more specific as I've matured in, in this industry and it's a natural process. Um, don't be terrified by other photographers who are doing much better than you are or who are in their own lane. 
because everybody moves at their own pace. I mean, obviously there are days where I also tell myself that I'm not doing enough, you know, because it's a natural part of being a creative. But just keep doing what you do. And I think more important is just keep shooting. I think a lot of people can give this advice because even if it's not perfect, even if you don't really feel like it, just try because you never know what might come of it. So I think that was the main thing that got me through it. Yeah. So I'm going to go a bit into architecture while you switch yeah. on your life. Yeah, that's, that's a signal for me. So I'm just going to disappear. I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to disappear for, for about a minute. See yeah. you shortly. <laughs> See you shortly. So I just, I'm just going to like, hey guys, I can't really read the chat, so I'm not sure what's going on in the chat, but I'm just continuing a bit about architectural photography. Um, because like I said, I do a lot of travel and architectural photography, so it only makes sense and it's reasonable that I touch a bit on this. Um, with architectural photography, it's... I do it slightly less than travel photography um, because, well, I don't know really, because obviously I think I enjoy traveling a bit more and architecture can be a part of traveling. Um, back in Malaysia, I am um, affiliated with the Malaysian Institute of Architects. So with them, I do a lot of um, photo shoots for the magazine. Um, as an architectural photographer, there are so many avenues in which you can make money. Um, you can go into interior photography, you can go into um, publication photography, I think that's mostly where the money is. Um, but for me, it ties in into travel photography. So whenever I travel, I have a bit of architectural shots that I will give um, to maybe publications or to exhibitions who might want to exhibit them. So that's how I market my work. Um, I think architectural photography for me is not limited um, to certain um, styles. Um, obviously, there are certain rules when you want to do it for documentation, um, for competition entries especially because um, there are certain standards for architectural photography that has um, all of those uh, proper um, submissions. You will need to have the straight lines, the proper um, framing and everything. But when you're traveling and when you're shooting architecture, it can be a bit more versatile. I don't know. If, I don't know if you were hearing me while you were switching on the light. I did. I'm... I did. Okay. <laughs> I <laughs> just had to, yeah. to walk around the studio. The uh, switching yeah. on the light here at the studio is a is a bit of a pain. So just yeah, I just had to to go to a few spots. Hmm. All right, but you look very well lit now. I think much better than me. Because Thank I'm... you so much. I feel much better now <laughs> instead of sitting in this dark cave. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad. Um, yeah. So is. So where, where was I? Yes, um, travel. I do uh, my architectural photography is part of my travel photography, and I think I get to experiment a lot because I'm not um, I'm not too boxed up by the submission requirements for competitions, for example, or publications. Because, like I mentioned, they will require certain um, certain ways of how to shoot architectural photography. But in travel architectural photography, you you have a bit more versatility. But I just wanted to share with you, um, I think this is one of the last few photos. Um, during my travels, one of the photo series that I had worked on uh, as a background project, sort of, it's more of a personal project, is um, symmetries in locations. So I think if you remember, if you recall the Iceland photograph, photograph earlier with the mountain and the buildings, that was to the right of this shot. Normally people would this shot, the shot that sees the road going down. Um, to the lake uh, and you know it's just a very um, famous shot that you can take in Reykjavik but it's also quite similar to a shot that I have in Porto I think this was in Porto so throughout my travels I've collected all these little series of um, locations that are almost similar and this was Athens um, I think that's the Pantheon, Pantheon uh, in Athens in Greece and the composition is almost similar to the landscape <laughs> Barcelona, I think this was Barcelona. So I, I really enjoy finding all these um, little, little quirks in cities that become familiar to you because I think once you start traveling all over the place, you find that um, identities of cities are not always so unique. Like they can be unique, but there are always so many similarities. And you also develop your own character as a person in understanding that you are a citizen of the world. You are not just, you know, you're not just defined by your nationality or you're not just defined by your student ID or your national ID or whatever. 
you are not you are a soul who is part of a very big beautiful universe i think that's one of the biggest things i've learned as a travel photographer um like i said this is a street in rome which is quite similar to canary wharf i think um is this finding all these similarities in urban fabrics that you know trains my eye is it's a background thing but once you start noticing these visual cues it helps you find patterns it helps you um find meaning find stories find um relations to the places that you visit because they become a part of your story and this is an alleyway in turkey oh my god There's so many places and i'm just trying to recall them so it's <laughs> an alleyway in turkey that's quite similar to another alleyway in porto um which is i think you know i think and this is a simple project that i've i haven't yet pitched to anybody but if you are a budding photographer out there i'm sure that you also find can find familiarity and relations into the locations that you visit and like i said all of these shots that i just scrolled through just now are still architectural shots because they involve the the urban fabric and i think you should not think you know if it's architecture it has to be certain very straight lines and very clean spaces that is also part of it but there are many ways to define architectural photography um and i think this is my last yeah it's my last one um i will be hosting an exhibition in october at the university of greenwich um so please um whoever is watching whether it's in london holger you're invited i'll invite you personally I'm and it will show more of my Yes, definitely. It will show more of my architectural works. Um, these are more mature ones that I have personally shot, um, knowing that I wanted the output to be in a certain way. You can see within this four series, just as a teaser, that I use a lot of elements of um, symmetry. I use a lot of. I pay attention to the lighting. I highlight the patterns. I highlight the structures, and these are very very basic elements of architectural photography. Um, I think architectural photography as a topic is a whole other subject in itself. Um, if you ever get into it, I would be happy to converse with anybody who's watching who wants to chat about it. Um, I wouldn't consider myself a professional master architectural photographer, but it's something that I really enjoy and having studied it, uh, it has really become something personal to me. Um, if you have some an interest outside of photography in a certain, it really helps you develop your career as a photographer as well like for me having graduated architecture obviously i gravitate towards um architectural photos so it really helps and yeah i think that's so what is just a bit more photos of architectural patterns so yeah <laughs> amazing yes i've got the um so now everybody uh it's a good time to ask any questions um don't be shy <laughs> so we hear, you know, that's the reason why this is a webinar and why we all came together. So it's a really good opportunity to uh, to grill Acacia a bit, you know, to to ask her technical questions. It could be something about her approach to work. And I'm going to make the um, I'm going to make the start here with two questions. I have the first one is um, just want to know if you could make like a holiday if you would. I don't know, maybe you have explored one place that you would like to revisit or is there a particular place that you, where you always want to go where you haven't been yet? Where I have not been yet. Um, oh, uh, I think South America we born. I think South America's landscape, I think Bolivia, Chile, Peru would be so amazing to shoot. Mm. Yeah, I think that's one of the places. And maybe um, I think everybody's dream would be to go to a wildlife safari in Africa somewhere maybe yeah. in Kenya have you ever been I think no. I, I find myself asking I've, you know. I've been to South Africa for quite a, quite a few photo shoots but nowhere else unfortunately mm. yeah. yeah but I, I haven't been I've never been to South Africa I'm sure the culture would be something very vibrant yeah and um, let us know what is um Do you have anything planned afterwards? Like you're currently working on a uh, on your exhibition. Um, any plans afterwards? Where is it going to take you next time? Are you going to pursue um, the concept of travel photography, or do you have something something completely different up your sleeves? 
Um, I think for me personally, within the next couple of years, I definitely would love to continue building my portfolio in travel photography. Um, I've also enrolled in a couple of, um, you know, meetings with certain uh, tourism bodies here. So hopefully that will lead to a couple of projects. Um, it involves a lot of hard work and a lot of pitching because obviously now it's so, so uncertain in terms of travel globally, but places are slowly starting to open up and I hope to contribute to it. And also, I think it's a personal mission of mine to, um, to enhance the tourism industry in Malaysia. As a travel photographer who's been all over the world, I think I really want to contribute on capturing more beautiful photos of Malaysia and just sharing that with the world. So that is one of my life's mission. But within the next couple of years, yes, definitely we're still within the travel and architecture industry. It's, it's a path that, that is not very well known. I think a lot of photographers go more into commercial photography or get align themselves with a production house. Uh, me as the individual freelancer, I'm figuring out the path on my own. So hopefully it'll come something amazing will come out of it at the end of this journey. Yeah, it's a lot of risk. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to forward uh, a few of those questions on to you. Um, okay, sure. So we have uh, Brad Gordon. He asks, uh, which can camera body you would recommend for travel photography? Oh, um, well, because I'm using it right now, I would recommend the Canon EOS R. It's a full frame mirrorless, so it won't be as heavy as a DSLR. Um, and with the new line of RF lenses, you can experiment a lot. Oh, please do try, if you ever get a chance, try the RF uh, 7200, because the old EF, Canon EF 7200 is about this big, you know, 1.4, 2.8, mm -hmm. and you, it's so hard to carry. But the new RF is just bought something like that. And mm -hmm. you can get amazing shots um, with the lens like that, yeah. I would recommend the Canon EOS R, or if you want something less, maybe uh, something slightly within budget, maybe Canon EOS RP. It's not a full mm -hmm. frame, but it's, so that's good, yeah. We've got a um, question from, an, it says, anonymous attendee. Uh, so wherever that is, I thank you so much for your, uh, for your question. He says, I'm curious uh, how you'd find ways or alternatives to continue with your travel photography um, during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it is still nice to see you just continuing locally and domestically. Also, maybe a really interesting question, if it could take you anywhere in the UK, have you explored something that's uh, like the Highlands, for example? Um... I, I went to a couple of locations during my student years, but I've just got I just got back to London. So maybe maybe isn't maybe I would love maybe I will go to one of the Highland locations, um, one of these in this next coming months. I think nearer to UK, Ireland is a really great place to photograph. I think Scotland as well. So hopefully I'll get to go there. Yeah. Mm. We've got another question from Farah. He says, "Do you think it's uh, it is necessary to attend?" A photography course for beginners? I think, see, photography, because photography is an, a very artistic well, and technical as well um, field. Um, I feel like with learning and education and learning by yourself, I feel like there's always a certain level that you can reach when you learn by yourself. And beyond that, you would have to find mentors or find books or find courses that will help you gain a bit more skill to grow a bit more. I think going for photography courses is obviously a very helpful process. I would encourage anybody who can afford it, who have time, who have um, the financial disposition to go for photography courses because a learning is always a good thing to have. You know, learning is always an investment. It's always a good investment because you grow yourself. Um, that being said, Obviously, a lot of people will probably say that, you know, oh, you don't need to go to photography courses. You can learn it by yourself, learn it from YouTube. But I think, like I said, learning is always a good thing to invest in. So, yeah, mm. I would say it's a good thing. Yeah, I think particularly YouTube can be a really tricky thing nowadays. There are so many people um, with different opinions, sometimes like opposing opinions. And also, you know, everybody can just publish a YouTube video and it's not necessarily... Uh, the correct way to do it but you know as I said like people have opinions and they really want to voice it so it can be a tricky thing there there can be some real diamonds on YouTube 
um, but you can also, you know, sometimes just end up in a dead end road. I think, yeah, yeah, and get and get confused. I think, yeah, yeah it's it's really difficult without actually knowing the subject really well. It's really difficult to differentiate. I think between the the good stuff and the bad stuff. Because you know, yeah. like, you know, at the beginning, how can you tell? Yeah? Mm. yeah. Any other questions, anyone? And and I think also like because photography is so subjective, and if you go to someone and you you look at a photo and, and just immediately say, oh, that's a terrible photo, mm. and it's like somebody can find the beauty in it, you know. Um, but I think for me, one of the ways to get around it is if you're just starting out or if you're developing your career, find photographers whose photos that you really admire. Um, that you really want to uh, well, emulate in a way that you really that you really think that that's the direction that you want to go in, and find ways that help you um, get the necessary skills to get to that to develop those sort of photos. For example, you might you might be into food photography, so find photographers who are who you who you whose photos you look at and you really get inspired, and and find and find people who can guide you towards that sort of photography. I think mm -hmm. because I think if you're just going blindly, it's easy to get very confused. Yeah, mm, that's true. We've yeah. got Dimitra. She asks. Um, you mentioned you would you were approached by travel agencies through social media. Do you think it plays a very important role for contracted work? For contracted work, um, Dimitra, do you mean uh, that social media plays an important role to be to be commissioned? I assume that that's probably yes. <laughs> yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. Hi, what do you thank think, you for what what role do you think social media plays for photographers or aspiring uh, maybe professional photographers nowadays? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, personally, I feel like it's very important. But that being said, you see, social media is just another platform, and platforms are just another doors, another door to open opportunities with. So the more doors you open, the more opportunities are open for you because you never know who might be looking in to the room of your work and, you know, thinking, oh, that, that might work. So if you, I mean, I know it takes a lot of work, but if you have social media, if you have your digital platform all sorted out, it's so, so much easier for companies to find you. And I think now especially it's quite important. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just another platform for you to put your work out there and you know nowadays to be fairly honest the market for photographers there's so many of us out here so many of us want to make it big want to be successful obviously so when you have everything so sorted out and people can easily find you it's a bit easier for you to build a career out of it yeah mm, yeah it's a you know it's a complicated question i guess because the um I think, for example, like one of my favorites, um, photographers who's a commercial photographer, but like an advertising photographer based in the US, but he does some really, really amazing, very daring work, I would say. Um, I was really glad to see the other day that he only has like uh, 1,000 followers on Instagram, and he's yeah. one of the biggest advertising photographers in the US. So it is, it is, it really depends on, I guess, like on oh, the yes. genre of yes, the yes. photography market where you want to specialize. Um, you know, sometimes it's absolutely essential. And I even know some photographers don't get jobs because they didn't have enough followers. Oh, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So sometimes that actually happens. Right? Yeah, and yeah, I, I, I think so, yeah, as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think you're right. You, you, you brought up a really good counterpoint. Um, I say it's, it's important, but obviously it's not everything. So mm -hmm. if you don't have the following on your social media, do not worry that it will hinder you from, I mean, don't worry so much about it, I think. Don't let it define you. Don't let your followings define you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key message here. Uh, put your work out there in any and in every way possible. I think that's the key message. And mm -hmm. social media is just one of the platforms. And I think that's why I say it's important. But at the same time, don't let it define you. Don't think that just because you have 10,000 followers on work, on whatever it will guarantee a career because it won't. What matters at the end is your body of work and your attitude. I think attitude is something that doesn't really get discussed in the photography fraternity, but 
is plays a really important role in getting jobs. So mm. you can be a really amazing photographer, but if you're a bit of a jerk, I think nobody's going to want mm. to work. It's true, absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying here on a Friday evening. I hope you have a lovely yeah. weekend and hope to see you soon. And thank you so much for your amazing talk, Akaja. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. And, and of course, we're going to meet at thank your you exhibition, so right? Yes, October, I'll okay. text you. Okay, super. Thank you so much. High five from us. Thank you, Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers.